Hi there, it's Alexandra from the Middle Sized Garden YouTube channel and blog and today we're talking about planting on a slope and general tips about sloping gardens or even if you've just got a sloping border. And I'm here with Stephen Ryan, horticulturalist and broadcaster whose nursery, Dixonia Rare Plants, is near Melbourne. And Stephen's going to explain to us how to plant on a slope but also some of the issues that you would get with the best plants to choose if you're planting a sloping border. He's also going to talk about how to solve some of the problems you get when you're planting on a slope. Well, when you're working on a slope, of course, the biggest issue is finding plants that are going to anchor themselves well and also ways and means of which you can keep things watered until such time as they are properly ensconced in the garden. So it's really important to work out the right sort of plant material, whether it be sunny or shady slope, uh, and then to work out how you're actually going to make sure those plants are irrigated until such time as they're well established, and even then potentially afterwards, because if we get a dry summer, then you will still have to water. So the effect of how you layer the bank uh, or slope so that the water will stay on board is what it's about. Because if you water just a, a sloping bank, most of the water is going to end up at the bottom. Uh, the plants aren't going to make use of it. So the installation of swales, which are basically just little ditches that you run across the contours of the, the slope, are a great way of dealing with that and also banking the plant into its own little um, nest of rocks or bricks or whatever you've got at hand or what looks attractive to you so that they're sitting in a little ditch so that you then water well from above and the water will sit there and soak in. So all those things are things that you need to consider and also of course banks and slopes can be quite difficult to manage long term so you need to make sure they're well and truly clean of weeds and other sundry detritus before you plant and that they're properly mulched afterwards so that that keeps weed seeds down. And it also helps stop the water from flowing too fast and also uh, then helps water soak in. So they're the main things that you need to consider. All right, so the first thing you need to do if you're going to plant on a slope is install your little swales. So your little ditches that run along the contours of the slope. Uh, they don't have to be particularly deep or all that terribly obvious, as long as there is that little ditch that will hold water back. I generally suggest planting below the swales, so that way the water sits above and then soaks down into your plants. And then you can build your little um, retaining walls uh, in which you're going to then dig holes to plant your plants. So as I said, install some bricks or rocks. I mean, these things don't have to be uh, structurally all that sound because you're not necessarily going to be using them to clamber up the bank or whatever at other times. They're just there to hold the soil back, even temporarily until such time as the root systems are anchored. So they're the two main things. And of course, I mentioned making sure it's clean of weeds. Also make sure it's mulched, but it's often a good idea to mulch after you're planting because half your mulch is going to end up buried by the soil from the swale or in your ditches and so forth. So mulch after planting. Um, so if you can get several swales through a bank um, and then your little platforms in which you're going to plant, then you can come back and put uh, your selected plant material in. It's, it doesn't require an engineer. Uh, it is quite an easy thing to do. So yes, you don't have to be too specific about it. Obviously, your swales will work best if they are more or less following the contours. That way the water will sit in place and then soak down through. And yeah, you just need to find some things that are going to hold the soil back. Uh, most plants that you're going to put onto a sloping bank like that are going to billow out and become quite substantial because part of the point is to try and cover and green up a bank so you don't want little sort of pencil-y things sticking up there so big sort of swelling plants so anything you've put in there to hold things back in, and including your swales are all going to disappear amongst the plant material as time goes on and then you'll just end up with this wonderful bank of foliage and flowers. So what about specific plant recommendations what goes well in a slope and I have heard that you need a deep rooted plant is that true? Well, I don't actually believe you need plants that are particularly deep rooted. I mean, it won't matter uh, if they are, but I actually think plants that have a really good matty root system that is in fact going to bind the soil together on the surface uh, are actually more important. And in fact, if they're plants that can root as they hit the ground, even better, because that way it will hold the whole slope or bank together. So something that has uh, a layering habit that will work its way down or up the bank and root down as it goes so that you actually end up with 
a whole series of plants in a sense, uh, and that will bind everything together because long-term binding of a slope or bank is really important. And also a thick canopy of foliage plants so that it actually helps to suppress weeds. Because the last thing you need to do as we get a little older is clamber up these banks trying to manage a weed issue. So the thicker you can get your plants to grow, the less problem you're going to have with managing the bank. So it then becomes as hopefully management free as possible. All right, if I was going to plant, uh, you have to look at whether you're planting a sunny bank or a shady bank. So let's start with a shady position far, first. And a shady spot is often also comparatively dry because it's often shady because of trees overhanging. So therefore there's tree roots involved and other things as well. So they can actually be quite difficult banks to cover. Uh, you can obviously fall back on the old uh, stalwoods like ivy and such things if, if that's an appropriate plant for your area. Um, but there's lots of other plants that will grow very, very well on a shady bank. And I would look at things like the smaller growing vincas. Uh, I would look at ruscus, which is a wonderful plant from uh, the Mediterranean that will grow in, it'll almost grow in a cupboard. It's so hardy, it will grow in dense, dense shade, it will grow in root infested shade, and it will also grow where there's almost no moisture. So things like Ruscus and its relatives, there's another thing called Danae, which is a wonderful clumping plant that covers banks really well. So there are quite a number of interesting plants. Now, conversely, if I was working in a sunny spot, then you need to have a whole different palette of plant material. In warm and temperate climates, the first thing I would fall back on potentially for those sort of sites are some of the spreading succulent species. They're fantastic. I mean, they don't need to be watered. They'll cope with 40 degrees in a howling northwesterly wind, or at least in Australia, it would be a northwesterly wind that would be the worst one. Uh, and, um, you know, you can have lots of flowers and lots of textural foliages uh, and they become very self-managing as time goes on. But there are also lots of shrubby plants that, uh, uh, particularly of Mediterranean origin, some of the dwarf cytisuses, the brooms, some of the cistuses are wonderful, the, the spreading rosemaries are fantastic. There's a whole range of plants like that that have a good matty root system and will cover the ground and grow dense enough to be weed suppressing. Because the other thing people forget is if they put in a ground cover and it's very close to the ground, it actually still lets quite a lot of light through. So therefore, very flat ground covers tend not to be particularly weed suppressant. So if you've got something that gets to sort of, you know, a foot tall or more, um, uh, then you will tend to find that those plants will actually stop the light getting to the ground as well. And then therefore they'll become more weed suppressant. So there's a few ideas, but the palette of plants you can use is huge. It is a matter of going out and having a look. I mean, I haven't even touched on the idea of a damp bank where there's a whole range of other plants that you might well use, um, uh, like the Persicaria, actually actually, that I, I used as an example that we planted a moment ago. Uh, it's fantastic uh, as a bank cover in a moist aspect that gets reasonable sun. So you've got to look at all those things. If you wanted to plant something like the border we've got behind us, uh, you don't necessarily have to do a lot more. The one thing you do have to make sure though, because the types of plants that you use in a classic herbaceous border, things like dahlias and delphiniums and you know all of the classical plants that you use, they're all quite hungry, greedy plants. So you would have to make sure that you had good soil preparation before you planted, get lots of manure in, make sure the ground is in good fettle. And once you've got that in place, it also means that it allows for better water penetration as well, because you've got lots of humus in there. Uh, so it's really soil preparation that is the big thing to make sure that you can grow those classical herbaceous perennials. And then there's no reason why you can't do it. I guess the only other thing you have to consider is that when you're working on a slope like that, if you've got a flat herbaceous border, you tend to plant things that grow to certain heights at the back and tearing down towards the front. You've got to be a bit more careful how you tee your plants on a slope because you can end up with your very tall things right at the top of the border, uh, towering over things by, by many feet uh, and looking slightly dis proportionate. So you have to be a little more careful about how you place the plants from the uh, respect to their heights. But otherwise, there's no reason why you can't do it. All right, well, mulching on a slope, uh, you need a material that's reasonably porous. Uh, so you don't want something that's too fine. If aesthetics aren't that much of a problem. I actually find things like straws and hay and uh, uh, loosened straw, all those sort of things is a very good mulch on a slope because they tend to mat so that they make this nice bindy mat that holds in place. They also allow water penetration reasonably well so they're not so dense that they become this sort of matty thing. If you use something at the other extreme, say for instance, like you had sawdust available to you and you use that as a, as a mulch, the issue with sawdust is that you're going to end up with a crust on the top and the water's just going to run off. So 
the mulching material you use needs to be open and, and, and lighter, but something that's going to bind together. Uh, really coarse um, tree shreddings might work quite well, but I would say the haze and straws are ideal as long as the aesthetics of that slightly rural look doesn't worry you. Homemade garden pot compost is fantastic to put onto a bed, but I still think you need an other mulch over the top of it. And I'd do the same if I was using some animal manures. I mean, if you use horse manure on a garden bed, you tend to find that there's often weed seed in that unless they're stabled horses. Uh, and so therefore you need to put something over the top again to keep the weeding down. But yeah, home compost is always a great material to use, but you need to keep in mind that you may be reintroducing the forget-me-nots you thought you'd taken out. So, you know, they're the sort of things you have to consider. If you enjoyed that, please do hit like, because then I'll know you'd like to hear more about planting in difficult situations. And if you'd like more tips, ideas and inspiration for your middle-sized garden, then subscribe to the Middle Sized Garden YouTube channel. And thank you for watching. Goodbye.